Let's work through an example where I'll cover production possibility frontiers, opportunity cost, comparative advantage, absolute advantage, terms of trade, complete specialization, clearing prices, bartering, and the law of comparative advantage, essentially showing that two individuals or two countries can potentially benefit from specialization and trade. Let's consider two individuals, Ada and Ben, who can produce either good X or good Y in a certain amount of time, let's say an hour. So in an hour, Ada can produce either 30 units of good X if she spent all of her time producing X, or she could produce 20 units of good Y if she spent the hour producing only Y. And Ben, in that same amount of time, could produce either 45 units of good X, if that's all he did, or produce 120 units of good Y. Now, before we start talking about specialization and trade, let's see what Ben and Ada can do on their own. So to do that, I'll provide a graphical illustration. We'll graph each of their production possibility frontiers, or PPFs. We'll start with Ada, put X on the X axis and Y on the Y axis. And if she spent all of her time in that hour producing X, she could produce 30 units. If she spent all of her time producing Y, she could produce 20 units. And we're going to assume constant linear trade-offs here. In addition to these two points that I've already outlined, along some opportunity costs, she can make trade-offs and produce some combinations of X and Y. Now let's draw Ben's production possibility frontier. And in an hour, Ben can produce either 120 units of good Y or 45 units of good X or some combination of X and Y along this straight line. Anything inside of the production possibility frontier, say point alpha, is attainable but inefficient. We know it's inefficient because at this level of x1, Ben could produce more y, more units of y, without giving up any units of good x. However, points such as point beta here are attainable and efficient because Ben could potentially increase his production of good X, but to do so, he would have to decrease his production of good Y. And finally, points outside or beyond the PPF, such as point gamma, are currently unattainable, given the certain set of productive resources that Ben has on hand. Okay, now that we've drawn their production possibility frontiers, I'm going to label them. This is PPF sub B, and this is PPF sub A. Now let's calculate Ada and Ben's opportunity costs associated with the production of good X, and also the opportunity costs associated with the production of good Y. To help you get familiar with the notation, follow along with me. So Ada's opportunity cost of producing good X is equal to the total amount in an hour if she was specializing in the production of good Y, which going back is 20 units, over the total amount of good X that she could make in an hour if she only produced X. And we need the units of X to cancel out because we need to express Ada's opportunity cost of good X in terms of the other good in terms of good y. So the result, simplified, is 2 thirds a unit of y. This is what Ada gives up every time she produces one unit of good x. Likewise, Ada's opportunity cost of producing good y is simply the reciprocal of her opportunity cost of producing good x. We would calculate this as 30 units of good x over 20 units of good y times y so that the y's cancel out and we're left with 3 halves x. Now let's do the same for Ben. Ben's opportunity cost of producing x is equal to the amount of good y that he could produce in an hour, if that's all he was doing, 120 units of good y, over 45 units of good x. 
times x. The x's cancel out, and we're left with 8 thirds y. Ben's opportunity cost of producing good y is equal to 45x over 120y times y. The y's cancel out, and we're left with 3 eighths y. Now let's consider the question. Who has a comparative advantage in the production of good x, and who has a comparative advantage in the production of good y? Let's consider two types of advantages first. So comparative advantage, what I just mentioned, is defined as producing at the lowest opportunity cost. Whereas absolute advantage is simply producing a certain amount of output using a lower amount of inputs. Or we could think of it in this example, since time is really the only input that we're considering, that whoever can produce the most of a good within a certain amount of time has an absolute advantage in the production of that good. So we can see that Ben has an absolute advantage in the production of good x and an absolute advantage in the production of good y. It might be tempting to think that since Ben has an absolute advantage in the production of both goods, that really he can't benefit from trading with Ada. However, that's not true. What matters is that Ada and Ben have different comparative advantages. That's going to tell us whether or not they can benefit from specialization and trade. We don't really care about absolute advantage. We do care about comparative advantage. Who has the comparative advantage in producing good x? So Ada has a lower opportunity cost associated with production of x, so she has the comparative advantage. Who has the comparative advantage in producing good y? In this case, that's going to be Ben. So Ben has the comparative advantage in the production of y. Ada has the comparative advantage in the production of x. Now the law of comparative advantage, the law of comparative advantage, tells us that if these two individuals want to increase the production of a good, then each should do so by using the available productive resources with the lowest opportunity cost. Or, in other words, they should specialize according to their comparative advantages. And we're going to assume that they engage in what's called complete specialization. In this case, meaning that Ada will produce X and Ben will produce Y. So if that's the case, then let's consider what their combined production possibility frontier could look like. So we'll draw this out again. Y and X. The first type of production we should consider is if both Ada and Ben produce only Y. In that case, Ada will produce 20 units of good Y, Ben will produce 120 units, so together they can produce 140 units of good Y. If they both combined their production of good X, Ada producing 30 and Ben producing 45, then they could produce 75 units of good X. Now if they engage in complete specialization according to their comparative advantages, then Ada will produce 30 units of good X, and Ben will produce 120 units of good Y. So all in all, their production possibility frontier looks like this. From 0 to 30, Ben is producing 120 units of good Y that entire time. And we can see that the slope here is equal to the slope of Ada's opportunity cost. The slope along this portion from all the way from 30 units to 75 units of good X Ada is always producing 30 units of good X. However, all throughout this period, there's a trade-off that exists as Ben is producing more X and less Y. And the slope here, this trade-off is equal to his opportunity cost.
of negative 8 thirds. Now drawing their individual production possibility frontiers on the same graph, 45 and eta's 20, 30. This is eta's original PPF. This is Ben's original PPF. And this is their combined PPF. Now we're going to assume that they produce at this amount, 30 units of good X from eta and 120 units of good Y from Ben. So let's imagine that they start with this. So from this point, eta has 30 X and zero Y. Ben has zero X and 120 Y. Now we want to determine the terms of trade. Okay, in this case, recall that when Ada produces X, she does so at a cost of two thirds Y. So for her, if we're considering the per unit price of good X, expressed in terms of y. So this is for every one unit of good x, how much y will be traded? If eta has x, then she wants to sell x for a price that's greater than her own opportunity cost. In other words, she needs to get a better deal than what she can get on her own. Meanwhile, Ben, when he chooses to produce x, he does so by giving up 8 thirds y. Now he's got y, so he could forgo 8 thirds y to get an x, or he could trade with eta. But he's not going to trade with eta unless he can get a price that's less than his own opportunity cost. And thus, between these two bounds are a set of prices where each of these prices will work. Each of these will function as a clearing price. In other words, a price of trade at which the trade will actually go through. It will benefit both people, so they're willing to go through with the trade. So this is where we started out. Now let's assume that for whatever reason, Ada and Ben prefer to have 15 units of good X. So essentially, since Ada has 30 to start out with, she's willing to trade 15 of those, and Ben's willing to trade away some of his Y to get these 15 units of X. So let's think of a price that falls between these two bounds. How about one unit of X for six thirds a unit of Y, or one unit of X for two units of Y. Six thirds falls between two thirds and eight thirds, so that'll work. That's a clearing price. So if they do this and Ada trades away 15, she'll have 15 remaining units of good X, and she'll also have 30 units of good Y. Ben will now have 15 units of good X that he received from Ada, and he's still got 90 units of good Y remaining. Let's see if specialization and trade made each of these individuals more productively efficient. In other words, gave them a greater combination of X and Y than they could produce on their own. So in this case, if Ben had produced 15 units of good X on his own, the maximum number of units of good Y that he could produce on his own would have been 80. And for Ada, if she had produced 15 units of good X, the maximum amount of good Y that she could have produced on her own would have been 10 units of good Y. However, in this situation, with specialization and trade, now Ada can have up to 30 units of good Y with her 15 units of good X, and Ben can have 90 units of good Y with his 15 units of good X. So he's increased the amount of Y along with his ideal amount of X that he wanted, 15, by 10 units of good Y, and Ada increase her amount of Y by 20 units. So at the end of this, what we've determined is that Ada and Ben can potentially benefit from specialization and trade. We haven't talked about indifference curves and we don't know what would be the optimal amount of X and Y according to Ada and Ben along some along different levels of constraints.
So we have yet to talk about that, but this is a good start.